Okay. Um, I think probably the best thing is when you want me to stop, I just stop. <laughs> <laughs> I could do it very quickly. Or I could go on all afternoon. Uh, I'm reminded, listening to all the very kind of serious philosophical statements which have been made, of a letter which was written by Anna Freud, describing, I think, probably uniquely odd circumstances where she took into analysis uh, a child who'd already been analyzed by Melanie Klein. Uh, the two of them, of course, were notorious <coughs> theoretical opponents. Anna writes that Melanie has given this patient the deepest and most profound analysis, coming to understand why the child wishes to eat his mother's breast and to live in his father's anus. I myself have the more superficial task, obviously, of just seeing what's going on and making the patient better. <laughs> uh, I think the problem with depth sometimes is that it starts borrowing the very things it's trying to give a kind of critique of. Now, it seems to me, in a childish way, and I'm going to remain uh, something of a child uh, throughout this presentation, that above all Derrida <coughs> enjoyed and employed a play on words. In a sense, his written and spoken practice played on words. Now, in England, or to a certain kind of Anglo-American culture, that is a total condemnation of Derrida. It's, uh, there are various disciplines in which people are denounced for just playing with words. As if playing with words was evidence of the emptiness and the triviality, and in a sense the underlying fraudulence of the person who just plays with words. One always wants to ask these people, I mean, what else is there to play with? I mean, as a terminal question. What do they play with? One can only speculate. Uh, now, I could here enter into a long theoretical discourse, but instead of that, uh, I thought I would tell you the very first joke that I remember. I'm not sure whether it's going to suffer <coughs> in translation, but I can remember even now the experience I had on hearing it and a little bit, a few seconds later, enjoying it. The joke, I can tell very quickly, it was, there was a tap on the door. So they sent for the plumber. I mean, it's obviously not going to strike you as terribly funny. I immediately, I can feel my soul go into a kind of <coughs> depressed tailspin. I didn't, as the English say, get it. Somehow I had the, a very strong image, suddenly, of a door. And 
and a tap on it, and at the same time, the tapping. In this kind of mixture of the tap, tapping, I found enormous pleasure. Just pleasure without limit. <laughs> On a bad day, I can still tell myself that too. <laughs> and it sort of works. I've learned that it's pretty disappointing because other people don't find it very funny. <laughs> but then you just think, that's okay, that's my joke. I was reminded of it last year uh, when I undertook a truly serious architectural undertaking, which was I was the first person at the AA to run an architectural school for small children. Uh, we did a very typical kind of AA project. I mean, in AA terms, it was on social housing <coughs> for the working class, but actually, I didn't do it for the working class. We went to the zoo and did it for animals, because uh, like animals, uh, have more variety than the social classes of England. There was one rather sad girl who didn't want to choose an animal to work with. <laughs> I kind of wandered around. She didn't really like them. You'd say, do you like lions? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's another girl that said, where are the snakes? <laughs> the... <laughs> Suddenly she found it. It was the ostrich. <laughs> you could immediately intuit something about her own kind of sadness. She was also quite large. And, you know, she knew that she moved without any great degree of elegance. <laughs> Suddenly this bird, if, if it's a bird, I think it is, <laughs> this ostrich, that's it. It's like she'd fallen in love. The love was redoubled by the fact that I was being helped by two Iranian students who explained to me and then to her that in Farsi, the word for a ostrich was a kind of compound hybrid noun which translated directly it was a chicken camel. A chicken camel. Believe me, her love was now forever. <laughs> Why does this happen? And in some sense, why is it that architecture is something like a tap on the door. <clears throat> now, the next, I mean, I, I sort of put this to one side and I'll return to it if I have time. Uh, the next question is, everybody has talked about Derrida and architecture, or architecture and philosophy. And the longer you're imprisoned in these rooms, you know, the more these seem to become real objects. You know, people start to defend architecture or attack it or whatever. But these really, I mean, are the sort of, these are, I think these terms aren't terribly useful if they're hammered out in conferences. Because really, they're just part of the sort of mass hysteria of conferences. No one thinks there's architecture 
if they're working in an architectural school. I mean, as it were, they don't walk around with some savage, slightly angry. You don't see people saying, there is architecture, as they walk down the corridor. I don't know about philosophy. I mean, maybe they do. Uh, so I'd like to look at a question which, in a sense, comes long before these rather abstract questions. And it's based really on my conviction, which I'm afraid is purely oral. I can't claim to have written a thousand articles on it. Um, I think maybe I need to borrow some of yours for my CV. Uh, how did students read Derrida? In particular, how did art and architecture students read it? Now, I have, I mean, let's, let's sort of cut to the chase since there's a problem about time. I think two things. They probably didn't understand it, if by understand, you mean in that professorial way of being able to abstract from it something like an argument so that you can say, you know, here are the similarities between Derrida and Heidegger and here are the differences and all the rest. <coughs> you know, the kind of everyday transactions of a profession. And that's fine. How did they read it? Derrida was one, there are some authors, but I think especially of Derrida, where for the student reading what you didn't understand was nonetheless a very important play. And I want to ask, in a way, a little bit about what that pleasure was and why, why it is a very important pleasure. It has to do with the play on words. Ultimately, and I'm permanently now, you're like a chronological super ego, uh, The play on words is a practical demonstration of what you might call the primacy of the scene. You know, I could sit here and give a long lecture on the primacy of the signified. I could give a long lecture on why there is no transcendental signified. And so it goes. The jokes. One of the great things about jokes is they're quick. The second thing is they work. <laughs> People laugh before they've understood it. <laughs> Uh, it's not like the poor old owl of Minerva. Anyway, you know, anyone want to laugh? No. Why are you so late? Um, what the, the pleasure of the primacy of the signifier is the opening up and creation of a new space. The space which is opened by the undoing of a repression. You have no idea how expensive repression is. I mean, I don't mean that in a political sense, and I'm sure President Assad knows that. Um, I meant in a psychic sense. To be a heavily defended subject, to be a subject with all this repression is unbelievably expensive in terms of psychic energy. <coughs> I mean, it's uh, 
the psychic economies of repression are sort of caught you know, in the same problems of the EU. Uh, the more you spend on the repression necessary for austerity, the higher the demand gets for more repression. The undoing of the repression, the opening of a space, has something to do with a new pleasure, which also in some sense is a gift. Now, of course, pupils and scholars of Derrida's writings will immediately kind of take the gift and we will travel in the direction of Marcel Mertz, etc., etc. But I'm not going to do that. I mean that Derrida is very clear about the fact that, and in a sense, is so from the, some of those very early papers that are published in the 60s. I can't remember what's called Play and something. Uh, that there's a certain moment in the lifting of repression in which two categories are at stake, play and giving. Of course, for Derrida, they will have <coughs> the full play of meanings. But particularly here, the give is, first of all, the give in a system. The fact that a system can be made to, to yield more. Of course, the other word that we use for doing that is that it has a give. Now, I wanted to put that together with the idea that, of course, Derrida can't be what you might call lessons for architecture, because, as he very may well made clear, the deconstruction <coughs> is not a question of identifying terms that are tainted by the metaphysics of presence. It is not a question of saying, you know, we have logocentrism, we have phallogocentrism, we have ethnocentrism, etc., etc. So please don't use them anymore. Because, and this is sometimes, I think, forgotten, we go on using them even there where we think we've gotten rid of them, possibly even there especially where we think we've got rid of them. <coughs> and as Derrida makes clear, <coughs> all this is founded on the fact that we desire to. That presence is, as it were, not just, you know, to use an old discourse, it's not just a petty bourgeois illusion which you can get rid of uh, by attending a party meeting. It doesn't work like that. It's there in you every morning. Presence perhaps finds its correlate in Freud more in the idea of the lost object. So rather than go through a theory of this, I'll just, I mean, the quickest way I know of explaining the lost object is to say every day I lose my spectacles. Or my pen. When I realize I've lost them, it seems to me as though I've lost much more than my glasses and my pen. At some level, in a kind of figural sense, it seems to me I've lost everything. Therefore, it seems to me if I could only find my glasses, I would have everything. Then you do stumble across your glasses, 
that nothing changes, it's just the same old shit. I mean, that is what you might call the everyday life of the lost object. You know, you lose something, and so you prop up on that loss a sudden access to the wish to have everything, whose other terms will include presence. It is in our nature as humans to want things that we cannot have. When they build a computer that wants things it cannot have, then I'll start listening to these arguments about, you know, will they be able to think? Uh, we think because thinking is about our way of dealing with the fact that we can't have what we want. That's what thinking is. I mean, it's called, you know, obviously, it's called things like philosophy or theory. In any case, I think theory, I mean, students have, tend to have, I think, a misapprehension. They think theory is something extremely abstract, extremely complex. You know, they think of it in terms, you know, it, it's high up somewhere. I think, on the contrary, theory is, is what is beneath the threshold of recognition by consciousness. A good theory is very much like a good interpretation. The moment you hear a good piece of theory, you know it's true. <laughs> All this stuff, let's have a seminar on it, it's all pointless. You might but know it, or you don't. And you know it there, where you can't really speak it, it's, it's like in your body. Because, you know, it would be better just to, to have the seminar saying, you know, which bit of your stomach was affected by this theoretical explanation. Now, before I end, There is, of course, then, within this frame, no utopia, no transcendence. And I think, in a sense, one thing perhaps yesterday that, that I think I tried to say, that perhaps needed to be added in to the conference, was that it would be, at least in my mind, a complete misunderstanding of Derrida to say, as it were, it was a new philosophical contribution to the ancient practice of architecture. <clears throat> because, of course, Derrida remained militant in his opposition to the pretensions of philosophy while also being, of course, aware of its strength. What, of course, he knew, however, is that you can't abolish things like logocentrism or whatever by fiat, especially by philosophical fiat. So there are some things where I think, just to end, the situation is uh, unexpected. And I'll say what I think is unexpected in the idea of tradition. Of course, tradition would, in some sense, be that thing which you could easily detect as being logocentric, etc., etc., etc. Why wouldn't a Derridian position be powerfully? opposed to tradition. <coughs> and yet it seems to me what Derrida does is to completely reformulate the idea of a tradition which does indeed return and continue. Now, one thing that I think is of importance here and here if I'm right, I think it's quite interesting, 
And if I'm wrong, there's no harm done. Well, not to you anyway. Uh, is this that Derrida's play on words, especially in the words difference, I mean, you would be able to, in your own minds, rehearse all the terms. One thing I think is interesting is that they are very specifically Roman, or derived from Latin, and Greek. I don't think there's a lot of playing on German, but I may be partly wrong. But it seems to me overwhelming Latin and Greek, available therefore in some sense to Romance languages and, and English where there's been a vast amount of Latin neologisms and borrowings. This play on words seems to have a curious kind of Latinate existence. If that's where you've been doing most of your play, then it's not suspect, you know, that if that's if that's the arena in which you've been playing. Gradually, in some sense, a certain between words comes to be a common property. Comes to be a common property almost in a sense with a certain, if not unconscious, then certainly pre-conscious association. So they they become a I wouldn't know what to call it. It's not a constituency. It's certainly not a party. It's really the binding of friends. The binding of friends who require something to share. Not to share in the sense that that's what they do because they're friends, because in a sense, especially thinking of Jean Nancy, I mean, uh, that is something we wouldn't think. But it's actually, to be more architectural, it's the topos. It's the topos of the Duridian clan. The Latin or Greek word where you play between. This, I think, had major effects. One is, despite the absurd and provincial attacks on Derrida by American and sometimes English universities, official academic culture, to my mind, Derrida, I mean, you know, it should have been given the Nobel Prize just for increasing students' reading. Suddenly, for a generation, actually reading Plato, Aristotle, had a purpose. Uh, you know, people were sort of brought up in the 50s in literary criticism in America when they're doing a you know, week on tragedy. They might be told to go and read Aristotle, but I mean, they don't really do it. Though. Can we just read something newer, please? I think Derrida is not alone here. We are seeing, in a kind of scholarly way, which isn't altogether reflected in what you might call an intellectual way, but an entire kind of renovation, but also change of that thing which we call the classical tradition. Now, there's no point getting up and saying, don't you think this is ethnocentric or whatever? Uh, answer, not much, no, I don't. Uh, you can see it in a number of fields where the past of antiquity is being so radically reconfigured that it may well, in a sense, uh, 
provide what Panofsky says, he said in the 60s in Princeton, that each age gets the classical revival it deserves. Uh, now, I've said about the pleasure of the reading, and I'll stop in just a second. What is it? The repression is lift. It's not a kind of instrumentally intellectual advantage. It's not the correct path. It's something very like the promise of happiness. I say the promise of happiness because, of course, I'm well aware that there is no happiness. But the promise of happiness is a great thing. Of course, the promise of happiness is how Chateaubriand defines life. The promise will be broken. There is, to my mind, a moment of high but unrecorded genius in the analyst Winnicott, who had an extremely difficult patient. Briefly, his diagnosis is that she could, could not ask for anything, for years. She is mute, sullen, antagonistic. Finally, one afternoon, she says to him, will you take me away for the weekend? And he says, yes, of course. He then later gives a paper on this moment to the Institute of Psychoanalysis. They're all looking at each other. Did, did I hear that right? Did I hear it? So someone gets up. I mean, someone climbing back. Uh, and says, excuse me, I don't know if I misheard you. You undertook to take the woman away for the weekend. And he said, yes, I did. And you took her away? He said, don't be ridiculous. Of course not. She said, well, would you mind telling me the benefits to the patient of you lying to them? He said, certainly. She needed to hear that it was possible to ask and gain an answer. The disappointment she would have suffered from my not going was infinitely small compared to the achievement of asking and getting the answer yes. She knew what it felt. Now, the question then turns on this issue of the promise that I have here that we kind of skip a great deal, so you'll have to intuitively kind of follow me. I think one of the experiences First of all, think of spaces uh, which have a particular sense of promise, where the promise itself brings an inexplicable form of happiness. For me, I know what this is. These are stationers' shops. Uh, my partner is absolutely fed up with the fact that as soon as I get to a city I've never been to before, I rush off to buy exercise books. I mean, to me, it, it, it's like everything. It's kind of like starting. It's different. Uh, a stationery shop, my spirits rise in a quite extraordinary way. I think something of that is architectural. We no longer can guarantee heaven on earth or anything like it. 
but we can, in many different practices, promise happiness. This question of promise is very important, and perhaps it's what's behind the lines of the English poet Philip Larkin, who wrote, wrote a poem in the 50s on visiting churches. He said, you know, why do I visit them? I'm not religious. I have a sort of vague interest in architectural history, but it's not accurate. As he's walking around, he sees a medieval tomb in which this warrior and his lady lie upon the top in stone. He notices that very discreetly. They are holding hands. He says in the final couplet, it proves our almost instinct, almost true. What will survive of us is love. 